Hello, my name is Jim Rogan, and in this session, we're going to talk about what is called generational curses. This is something you may or may not have heard about, but we're going to look at what does the Bible have to say about them. I've heard these, uh, this subject taught about more than once, and we want to look at what the Bible has to say. The basic idea behind a generational curse is that there is something from your past. Normally, people will say it's something you know, from your parents, grandparents, something from a previous generation that is influencing your life today or it will influence your life in the future. And typically when people have taught this, the source material they get is from some verses that are in the Old Testament, which for me is a little bit of an issue because if we're going to have some kind of a teaching or doctrine for New Testament believers, which is what we are, I think we ought to get it from the New Testament. Now let's look at some of these verses here, starting off with Exodus chapter 20. We'll start in verse four. He said, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And I've heard some people in teaching this doctrine where they'll read up to this part here, the third and fourth generation, then they stop. But that's not the end of the verse, and that's not the entire context either. But here he's talking about those who hate him, isn't he? That's what he says. But let's go on here to verse 6, and he says, But showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So he said that those who hate him, the iniquity is going to go to the third and fourth generation, but those who love him, there's mercy. Well, that sounds good. But let's look, let's keep going here. And uh, let's go, there's another set of scriptures here in Exodus 34, and the scriptures that I'm going to refer to are basically going to be on the screen, so I may not always take a lot of time, and it, uh, you may not be able to keep up with how I'm doing it, but the, the verses we're using, they'll be on the screen here. Now in Exodus 34, we see the same thing again. Exodus 34, starting in verse 6, says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. And that's good to know, isn't it? He's merciful and gracious, abounding in goodness and truth. That's good news, isn't it? That's our God. Go on to verse 7. He says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression <clears throat> and sin, by no means clearing who? The guilty, <laughs> visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, there's another one we'll look at here real quick. Then we'll talk about some of this. We'll go to Numbers chapter 14. So far, we've seen a couple of verses out of Exodus. Now let's go to Numbers chapter 14. And these are the verses that normally people will use, and I've heard them over and over, and they'll use these verses to teach this doctrine. So Numbers 14 and verse 18 says, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy. Now he keeps saying that. He keeps saying he's very merciful. We don't get what we deserve, do we? No, we, we haven't earned any of the blessings or good things that come to us from God, and we certainly don't deserve any of them. So it's good to know that He is full of mercy, right? Let's go back. Numbers 14, verse 18 says, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but He by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers to the children uh, of the children. Oh, excuse me. He by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Now, people will point to the part about the third and fourth generation and how it goes on and all the stuff like that. But really, you know, we need to focus on who is it talking about? Talking about those who hate God and those who are guilty. Now, are we people who hate God? Certainly not. Are we people who are guilty before God because of sin and, and transgression and iniquity, whatever you want to say? No, because of the blood of Jesus. But still, people say, oh yeah, but see, this is, this is a principle, and God has laid it down, and you can look in people's lives, because this is the other thing people do. They'll use a couple of verses from the Old Testament, and then they will give some examples in lives of people that they have seen where this has happened. But we can also look in the Old Testament here in Deuteronomy 24, and we'll see something interesting here in Deuteronomy 24, that's just as valid as what we saw in Exodus and Numbers. In Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16, it says, 
Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for their own sin. We see even in the Old Testament, when God was dealing more with the whole nation of Israel, even in the Old Testament, God was stressing personal responsibility. And that's something we definitely see today because it doesn't matter what your parents or grandparents believed about Jesus, you still have to accept him as your Lord and Savior, don't you? So we can't just take a few isolated verses and try to build some big doctrine on what we think is happening or try and use this to explain what we've seen happening in people's lives. We can't take an experience and put it on an equal level with what we see in God's Word. So let's continue now here. There's something very interesting we can see in Ezekiel. And we'll start in Ezekiel 18. And we can, the whole context would be Ezekiel 18, verses 1 to 24. We're not going to read every one of those verses just for time. We're going to have a little bit of a, you could say, a condensed teaching on this because we could say more. But we'll start in Ezekiel 18, and the whole context is verses 1 to 24. You can read that. But we'll give you the basic ideas from what is being said here, not trying to hide something or eliminate. You can read it all for yourself, not leaving out any of the good parts. <laughs> but Ezekiel 18, verse 1, says, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. So he says, now Ezekiel was a prophet in captivity, and uh, people were using, God says, this proverb. God refers to this as a proverb. He didn't say this is a biblical truth. He said it's a proverb. All right? So he said the proverb was, the fathers have done something, and the children have the consequences. The fathers have eaten sour grapes. The children's teeth are set on edge. Now look what God says about this in verse 3. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. He says, stop saying this. Stop saying that the fathers have done something and now the children are suffering. There's a point there we'll get to in a minute. Oh, excuse me. Go down to verse 5, where, where it tells us, says, if, if, but if a man is just and does what is lawful is right now, he's going to give this example, which he goes through in some of these verses. And as I said, just for time, we're not going to read every, every single verse. But he talks about, he said, if, if you have a father and a son and, uh, you know, the person who does something right, which is what he's talking about here, he starts in verse 5 saying, a man, if a man does what's just and lawful is right, and then he goes on to talk about some of these things, he does all the right stuff. Then he goes on to verse 9, says, if he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just, he shall surely live, says the Lord God. Now, okay, we're talking about a righteous man, we could say. Verse 10, if he begets a son who is a robber or a shedder of blood, who does any of these things, and he goes on and explains in verses 11 and 12 all the terrible things that were being done. Then verse 13, if he has exacted usury or taken increase, shall he live? He shall not live if he has done any of these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Now get the picture. First, we have this good man, a righteous man. Then we have a bad son who does bad things. He said, now, is this bad son going to be punished for this? Well, yes, he would. Now, go on even further. In verse 14, he said, now, if, however, he begets a son who sees all the sins which his father has done and considers but does not do likewise, started out with a good man, has a bad son, then the grandson of the good father, or the good man, the good man, bad son, and then another one who's good. Okay, we've got three generations here. All right, he said, and this one sees all the bad that his father did. What about this person? Okay, now it talks about some of the things. Then go to verse 17. He said, who has withdrawn his hand uh, from the poor and not received usury increase, but has executed judgment and walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. Now, it almost seems like we've got a contradiction because God was saying here in, in Exodus and Numbers that the iniquity of the fathers is going to go on to the third and fourth generation. But here he said, no, it's not. Well, what's going on? Well, we saw how he said in Deuteronomy, uh, in Deuteronomy is where he said that everybody's going to pay for their own sin. The soul who sins will die. There is personal responsibility and accountability. A lot of people don't like that. They want to blame somebody else for their problems. 
And that's an easy way out. But how about taking responsibility for anything you may have done? You may have started in a negative situation and you may have had disadvantages and maybe your family was a bunch of crazy people or something like that. But that doesn't really have to, have to, have to be the guiding force in your life. So let's go on here to verse 18. Now it's talking about the good son. Now it goes back to the bad father. It said, as for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, robbed his brother by violence and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. So he's pointing out that the people who do good are going to be blessed. The people who, who do bad will be punished and cursed. Verse 19, yet you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right and has kept all my statutes and observed them. He shall surely live. Verse 20, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wicked of the wicked shall be upon the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Go to verse 21. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Verse 22, none of the transgressions which he, had, which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. The point is, God is trying to show us that what your ancestors did is not as important as what you do today. I believe what God is showing us in what we saw in Exodus and Numbers is that there is consequence to sin. For those who are guilty and hate God, there are some negative consequences to the actions and the bad things that are done in life. But for those who love him, there is mercy, isn't there? And even those who hate him, there's mercy if they will turn to him. We cannot just take a couple of isolated verses and say, see, this is the way it is. Oh, because one guy was an alcoholic. Now his son is going to have an alcoholic, you know, generational curse on him. And, and here's what people will say. And I've heard this so many times and it, uh, it just annoys me. <laughs> where, oh, see, now you have to pray, and now you have to do this, and now you have to change that, and you have to do this. It, the answer always comes back to you end up doing something to somehow make right for what you did in the past. Oh, we're going to have an all-night repentance meeting, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. No, God clearly says the soul who sins is going to die. Person responsibility is the key in this thing. Not that you're suffering and you're bound in something today because your grandfather kicked a dog or something. Who knows? Whatever. Oh, and people told me, oh, but you know, in my country, because I've met people from all over the world, and people say, well, in my nation, they're cursing, and, you know, there's, there's witch doctors, and there's terrible people and all this stuff. Sure there is, and there's a devil out there too. And, you know, there's also a bus running down the street here later on. But I don't have to let any of these things ruin my life, do I? I don't have to stand in the middle of the street and let the bus run me over, do I? I don't have to allow the devil to torment me and harass me in my life. I don't have to allow mistakes and problems, even from my own past or my family's past, to dominate my life, do I? No. Now, even in the Old Testament, we see some examples about this. There's the kings of Judah. Now, Israel was a common nation. They divided into the northern and southern kingdoms at one point and the southern kingdom was referred to as Judah, there were some good kings and some bad kings. And if this was a biblical principle and a truth that is always working and enforced, so to speak, that the sin and iniquity is visited to the third and fourth generation, then pretty much every, every one of these bad kings would have only had bad children and it would just got worse and worse and worse. No, there is consequence to sin. That, that's definitely a fact. And the things we do can have a positive or negative influence on those who come after us. But just because someone in our past, someone in our family or in our nation even or whatever did something wrong doesn't mean we're bound under some kind of a curse. This is what people think. We don't see it in the kings of Israel, in Ju of Judah, I should say. The system of sacrifices. This is another example from the Old Testament. The system of sacrifices and offerings, you go back and you read all the stuff, somebody did this, somebody did this, whatever, you don't see anything about, now this is the offering that you present because your grandfather was an evil person. Or, now you can do all these offerings unless, you know, you're under some generational curse because that you can't break. No, there's no such thing like this. So again, offerings that we see, sacrifices and offerings in Israel, 
we don't see anything about a limitation given because of somebody's under a generation of curse. Another example is, and we'll look at this in a, in a bit later on, the king of Moab asked the prophet Balaam to come and curse Israel, and it didn't work. He couldn't curse those people because they were blessed by God. We'll look at that some more in a minute. And the great thing about this is, this story takes place in the book of Numbers. We'll look at that in a moment. But the great thing is, in Deuteronomy, it says that God turned the curse into a blessing. Somebody came and tried to curse God's people, and God turned it into a blessing. That's awesome. You think about that. <laughs> that somebody comes to try and curse you, tries to do something evil to you, God will turn it into a blessing. That's amazing, but that's how God does things. God is greater than the devil. God is greater than any kind of a curse or problem from the past. God is greater, and if we will have that mentality rather than, oh, what mistake did my grandparents make, or what, what problems did my father have, and now I'm under some kind of a curse. Because even though you are able sometimes to trace in a family something, of, a problem of father or grandfather or grandmother or mother or whatever, some problem they had, you can see it in some families, you know, carried on maybe with a child, you don't always see it happening like that. I know somebody, I think of an example right now, somebody I know of, and the father was an alcoholic, and so was one of the sons. But another son said, I'm not going to be like that, and they weren't an alcoholic. But if they're all bound under this same curse, then wouldn't both brothers have to be alcoholics? But it doesn't work like that. We're not bound by any of these things. These, the, any, any mistakes of the past, any kind of sin, any kind of curse even that somebody might try and put on you is not greater than the power of God. Don't ever let that get into your head. But let's look at this story in Numbers chapter 22. And first we'll look here in verse 12. Now these people come from the king of Moab. They come to Balaam who's a prophet. And they say, you come with us and you come and curse these people because they're coming, they're going to take my land away. I'm afraid of this. I want you as a prophet to come and curse these people because if you curse them, maybe they'll all go away or disappear or die or something. So now God talks to this prophet and here's what God says. God says, and this is to the prophet Balaam, God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. God says, look, don't go with these guys. Don't try and curse Israel because Israel is blessed. Well, he wasn't such a good prophet. He does go with them eventually. And then, oops, excuse me, Numbers 23, verse 8. We'll pick up the story here. And uh, so Balaam goes out, and he's going to try and curse these people. And God gives him something to say. Balaam comes back, and he says to the king of Moab, he says, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? This is the big question I wish people would answer when they want to teach on this generational curse thing. How can you curse somebody that God has blessed? Maybe it could be true that your family background is just terrible. Maybe they were a bunch of terrible, evil, rotten people. But if you're in the kingdom of God, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you had the blood of Jesus wash you clean from sin, then how can you curse somebody that God has blessed? How can you denounce somebody that God has not denounced? Hmm? That's a good question, isn't it? Let's go on here. Let's go down to verse 20. And, and this, what happens here, the prophet, he goes to do these offerings and stuff to see if God will say something. And God does say something. So the prophet goes back to the king repeatedly to tell him all these things that God is saying, but it's not what the king wants to hear. Because the king wants him to say, oh yeah, I put the curse on him, you know, and, and they're, they're in trouble now but it doesn't work. It doesn't work because God has blessed them. Well, let's go on here. Verse 20 of Numbers 23, and this is what the prophet says. Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I can't reverse it. You cannot reverse the blessings of God. Some person putting a curse on you, doing whatever, whatever, <laughs> they cannot reverse what God has done in your life. They cannot. That's what the Bible says. Verse 21 says, now this is where it really gets good. All right, Numbers 23, 21, where it says, you know, okay, I just had the comment on there already made. You can't curse whom God is blessed. Verse 21, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. 
Now, God says, I see no wickedness. I see no iniquity in Israel. And I remember reading this and thinking, um, you know, Lord, can't you read your own book? Because I can read the story of the people of Israel, and I see a lot of problems. I see some wickedness. I see some iniquity. I see some problems with these people. So if we would go backwards from this point, from chapters 22 and 23, where it's talking about the king of Moab tries to get Balaam to, count, to come and curse Israel, we can go back from there, first of all, seeing some of the problems in the wilderness. In Numbers 21, this is where Israel complains and some snakes come in because the people are complaining. Snakes come in and start killing people. Well, that's not good. Chapter 20, Moses, who was the leader of Israel, he disobeys God. When God says, you, you know, you, you uh, strike the rock and then you speak to the rock and he struck it twice. So Moses, the leader of the people of Israel, he disobeys. Another problem we have here in chapter 17, the people argue about who's supposed to be the leader. This leads to Aaron's rod that buds overnight. So the leader disobeys, people are arguing about leadership, people are complaining. We go on, chapter 16, there's a rebellion against Aaron and Moses. The ground opens up and swallows people. Now I kind of think if I was around and that happened, I would remember that. God said, I don't see any problems. Looking at these guys, no iniquity, no wickedness there, no. <laughs> There's a rebellion against the leadership. The leadership themselves has problems. One more here. In Numbers chapter 14, says there's a rebellion of the spies and Israel disobeys God by trying to conquer part of the land against God's will. You remember they sent in the 12 spies and 10 of them said, oh, we can't do it. Giants are too big. It said that was an evil report. They disobeyed God. They didn't believe God would help them. Then when, those, when, when that part ends, then the rest of Israel says, you know what? Okay, we will go in. And God says, no, no, no. Your opportunity's gone. And they disobey God and try to go in and it doesn't work. So here, repeatedly, you see all these issues, and it seems like there's a whole lot of problems in the wilderness. But this is the great thing. Like I said, people will use verses from the Old Testament, because there's nothing in the New, but they will use verses from the Old Testament trying to prove this generational curse concept that you might be under a curse because your father, grandfather, great-grandfather, whoever, did something terrible or something evil, and now you got to figure it out. What kind of curse are you under? We'll pray and we'll discern what kind of curse. You're under a curse of stupidity is what I think. <laughs> Maybe you think that's too harsh, but I don't like anything that hurts people and harms them and keeps them out of fulfilling God's will for their life and keeps them away from the blessings of God. Why could God say, I see no wickedness, I see no iniquity? It's because of the blood. Because of the blood. Now, we're still talking about the Old Testament, right? God saw those people in the Old Testament through the blood of the animal sacrifice that covered. Covered. It only covered their sin. That's why God could look down at them and say, I see no iniquity. There's no wickedness. Because he was looking at them through the blood of the animal sacrifice that covered the sin. So the sin was covered. The wickedness, the iniquity is all covered. And God says, I don't see anything. Now, this is where it gets even better, because today we have the blood of Jesus that has completely wiped away our sin. This is some good news. We're not supposed to spend our time looking backwards, trying to figure out where the problems are, trying to see what our mistakes have been, see what some of our relatives have done. No, we're supposed to look forward and think, you know what? I've been washed in the blood. I've been redeemed by the blood. I've been set free by the blood. The Old Testament, the animal sacrifice, was powerful enough. God's plan to deal with sin in the Old Testament, imperfect though it was, because it was just making a way for the New Testament, the New Covenant, even though that wasn't the perfect system, God still looked and said, you know, I don't see any iniquity or wickedness there. Today, how much better do we have it because of the blood of Jesus? Oh, that makes me excited, it makes me happy. Because like it says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He didn't say a few of the old things are gone and you still have to struggle because you might be under a curse and your life is going to be difficult until you pray and make it go away and you repent and you do that. No. 
He said, you're a new creation in Christ. I like that. I like being a new creation in Christ. I like that better than thinking about what kind of mistakes are in my past. What kind of things have I done wrong? What kind of things have other generations done wrong? No, I like to think that I'm a new creation in Christ. And the old is gone. It didn't say we're 75% new, 25% old. Didn't say we're eventually going to become a new creation. Didn't say after 10 years you're a new creation. Didn't say if you pray enough, read enough of the Bible, go to church every day, you'll be a new creation. No. If any man is in Christ, how do you get in Christ? You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth, as it says in Romans chapter 10. You become a new creation in Christ. Here's another one I like. 1 John 3.14 Ooh, that's good stuff here. It says, we know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. It says, we have gone from death, spiritual darkness, into the light. Completely. We're not halfway in between. It's not like in this room. It's not half light, half dark. It's not this side is dark, that side is light. You know, we got, you know, the dark side and the force and the, you know, the good and the bad and the yin and the yang. And all. no. We're a new creation who has passed out of death into life. Hallelujah. That's some good news, isn't it? We don't have to be stuck with all the mistakes in the past. Because remember, even in the Old Testament, where it said, how can you bless, how can you curse, excuse me, how can you curse the one that God has blessed? How can you denounce the one that God has denounced? As that, that prophet Balaam said, God has blessed them, I cannot reverse them. If you yield yourself to problems and mistakes, and oh, the devil's so powerful. Oh, the past is such a bad thing. Oh, I had some relatives who did this terrible stuff, and they, they put a curse on me. What am I going to do? If you open a door and allow some of those things to bother you, to get a hold in your life somehow, if, you, if you're living in fear that somehow you know, some mistake you made is going to come back to get you, then you're not living with an understanding of your identity in Christ. And what you need to do is get into the Word, get away from all these silly books and teachings telling you you're under a curse and I'm gonna, you know, I'll explain to you how to find your curse and what you're going to do. And no, 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 no. We need to get into the Word of God. We need to find out who we are in Christ. We need to do like it says in Colossians chapter 3 where it says our life is hidden with Christ in God. You want to know who you really are? Find out who you really are in Christ. And here's some more good news because it's all good news. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus redeemed us by becoming the curse for us. He took the curse on himself. And this is why you cannot curse the one that God has blessed, because Jesus took the curse on himself. The curse for violating God's law is greater than any kind of man-made curse, isn't it? It would be, but Jesus redeemed us from that curse. Verse 14 said that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Hallelujah. We've been redeemed. We've been set free from the past from the old creation that we were, we're a new creation in Christ, gone from death into life. The Bible says we've gone from darkness to light. We've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. He, he, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. We need to focus on the truth of who we are in Christ, what Jesus has done for us, not always looking in the rearview mirror. You know, there's a reason in your car why the rearview mirror is so small and the windshield is so big. You're supposed to look where you're going to go instead of always looking behind you. What we need to do is put down all the teaching that takes us away from who we are in Christ, all the teaching that tries, us to, tries to get us to focus on who we are naturally, what we've done in the past, mistakes we might have made, who our family members are. No, what we need to do is focus on who we are in Christ. And who we are in Christ is a new creation who is blessed and no man can curse that. Doesn't matter what's happened in your past, because with God, the future is always bright. So what we need to do is find out and focus on the truth of who we are in Christ, live our life based on that, see and understand what Jesus has done, get ourselves into the New Testament, spending time feeding on who we are in Christ, learning what belongs to us, understanding we've been redeemed, 
and always remembering that no man can curse what God has blessed. Generational curses? No. I'm thinking more about generational blessings because God is a good God, His mercy is great, and nobody can curse the man that God has blessed.